Hello, and uh, I'm Peter Fields, and this is my good friend Ryan Samuelson from Moffitt Library, and uh, we are looking at The Color Out of Space, our third Lovecraftian story, and for many people, it's their favorite, okay, and it, it, it demonstrates Lovecraft's grounding in science. Uh, one thing that strikes us right away is we feel like what's happening to this valley, what's happening to this farmstead is the effect of radiation. And that's something, again, uh, Lovecraft was an uh, amateur astronomer. He was uh, he he subscribed to many scientific and and um, physics journals. He was very interested in the sciences and the new discoveries uh, that were happening. Um throughout the 1920s. And these were groundbreaking discoveries that were being made, the basically, were, which we were completely reversing um, the various rules in, uh, that we had thought were in place. Uh, you began to have things like quantum mechanics taking over from, um, from normal atomic uh, theory. You have things like um, the theory of relativity beginning to over, overtake the theory of, of ether and, and, various, and various light theories. You have these I, these new ideas which are completely revolutionary and completely changing the way the, the world works. And these and these new scientific discoveries are in, a, are, in, are in a way very weird. They don't seem to make sense. They don't they don't seem to abide by what we think how things should work, so to speak. And Lovecraft was very in tune with that. And he I think this story is part of is part of, of pulling into those ideas. We see in the story a lot of ideas of experimentation, a lot of ideas of of scientists trying to figure out what's going on, what the properties of this new meteorite are that's been been discovered. And so I think I think Lovecraft's pulling from those ideas that he, he's been reading in these scientific journals, and and using that is, again to talk about the weird, as in the idea that that existential horror, that horror of the idea that everything we thought was true wasn't and that the world is much more strange than we think it really is that's right modern people from a lovecraftian point of view here's that unique heritage of lovecraft and the weird genre modern people maintain a contradiction we know that our common sense notions and a lot of our conventions are religious notions for things for instance are quaint and they don't account for what our science is intimating. Our science intimates a universe of vast age and vast dimensions. Human beings are infinitesimally <laughs> insignificant in the scale of the universe and possible universes. Quantum physics already have suggested the possibility of multiple universes, universes where there are different rules. And what, what Lovecraft is suggesting is, despite our insignificance, we became the object of interest. Another universe that operates according to different rules colonized us once upon a time, and they may come back. This universe this universe will may one day reestablish itself. That's that cult of Cthulhu, okay, that lurks between the lines of the Lovecraftian legacy. And so we get the story of the color out of space. And this is a very popular story as well. In fact, we'll revisit this story in a sense at the end of the class when we watch the film Annihilation, which is a modern remake of this story and it's based off of i forget the author's name but it's based off a series of novels of someone who's very much in the new weird who took upon themselves to say i love the story of call of cthulhu i want to remake it for a modern audience with modern sensibilities and, and modern insights and that's what we're going to look at so again this is this is the as peter says this is many people's favorite lovecraft story the color out of space for lack of a better term gives us a very important dimension of cosmic horror, cosmic dread, and that is awful transformation. A, a sense that not only were we once upon a time, once upon a time colonized by another world that operates according to different rules, but who we are, who we are as a species was shaped by it, that we have a heritage 
okay, that we have a belonging, that we are only just now starting to understand. And we have a destiny, a destiny that we're just now starting to understand. In any case, let me just mention, we once again have the disinterested outsider narrator, somebody who is not an intimate or direct participant, not somebody who's a main character telling our story. He's a surveyor. He's a surveyor who is an advanced man for a reservoir. Nahum Gardner's farm, Nahum Gardner is our, is, is our family man, our farmer, whom we're going to uh, be uh, uh, learning about. He's the one who, whose family experiences all the effects of the color out of space, the meteor that falls, okay? Uh, this surveyor, okay, is telling us the story of Nahum Gardner, his farm, and this little valley that ultimately is going to be filled with water. It's going to become a reservoir. This, again, and was during the period of time when uh, they're building hydroelectric dams, basically, across the country. And I will say, one of the things about this, this, um, this, this the narrator um, form that Lovecraft is using, it has really two, two purposes here. One is to make you identify with the narrator, to make, you, to make you say, oh, just like he is reading about this, I'm also reading about this. And the second thing is also, it gives you this layer of, of possibility that this, maybe this is a true story because it's someone's talking about something they heard or something they, 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 you know, Oh, by the way, this is something I've been investigating type of idea. And so it, it verges on sort of that, the crypt, cryptology uh, type of idea of, of, you know, um, in search of the old in search of type television shows, like this is something that might actually be true type of story. And so it has that quality to it. Like this is almost like a news story that someone has written. Exactly. Um, and um, the, we also have uh, uh, a story of the story of a family, and it's very relatable. And this family, for all intents and purposes, is incrementally, slowly taken over by this color out of space. This color out of space which at first seems to create a paradise, a garden world where the fruit, the plants, the trees are enhanced. There seems to be a motion in the trees, and it's not from the wind. There seems to be some kind of dynamic force at work, and it's wholly beneficial in the sense that, wow, Nahum Gardner is about to have a harvest like no other, but then it becomes ashen and it withers and our our family gradually changes and transforms until at the end well again what is the effect of the color out of space it's awful transformation it's spiritual in many ways that i'm re i'm reading from the bottom of page 193 okay not a man breathed for several seconds, then a cloud of darker depth passed over the moon, and the silhouette of branches faded out momentarily. At this, there was a general cry, muffled with awe, but husky and almost identical from every throat, for the terror had not faded with the silhouette, and in a fearsome instant of deep, deeper darkness, the watchers saw, wriggling at the treetop height, a thousand tiny points of faint an unhallowed, unholy radiance, tipping each bough like the fire of St. Elmo, St. Elmo, I'm sorry, like the fire of St. Elmo, or more, more aptly, the flames that came down on the apostles' heads at Pentecost. It was a monstrous constellation of unnatural light, like a glutted swarm, I'm at the top of 194, of corpse fed fireflies dancing hellish sarabands over an accursed marsh. And so here we see the, the color out of space, tra not only transforming this valley, this former farm, okay, but now ascending. It 
The color out of space came, and now it has laid claim to all its own, and now it is taking them home. And they look like countless fireflies, or interestingly, an awful alien Pentecost. And there we have that biblical allusion, not illusion, but allusion with with an A. Why would Lovecraft do that? It's so mischievous. But again, that's part of the Lovecraft story. We talk about the fact that, and we've mentioned this before, that again, the, the weird can induce either a great dread and a great fear of change or a great empowerment, a great hope for change. And it, it, it does both. And that's 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 one of the themes of the entire class this semester. And we see that perfectly in what Peter just said, this idea of uh, is it is it witch fire or is it St. Elmo's fire? Is it something truly unholy that we're seeing or is it something truly benevol benevolent and part of God's will? And again, those are the same phenomenon. They had two different names, both witch fire and St. Elmo's fire. And and as you constantly remind us, we see once again the template of the outsider story. It's it's not it's not the transformation we anticipated, but it is our destiny. It's our awful destiny. Our our religion, our common sense notions. We know, we know, we know in the back of our mind almost subconsciously, a kind of collective unconscious in that Jungian sense, that there's a world, a universe, a multiverse, whose portents, whose portents we have intimations of, but, in, but only imperfect knowledge of. But we don't feel like we're left out. We feel like we've been caught up. And there is a destiny a transformation to which we all belong, just like the character in The Outsider. It's dreadful, it's awful, it's terrifying, but at the same time, it's exhilarating. And there's that word you used, empowering. And again, we get that in here. We get the, we get the idea that it is both something that is, well, as Peter said, that there is an afterlife, there is an immortality. It's just not the one we were expecting. Precisely, exactum mundo. And I think that's enough for uh, uh, Colorado Space. We'll see you for the next one.